Okay, chapter 7, what has been going on was Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king of Persia, Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah found out that the, temp- the walls around the temple and around Jerusalem have not been re- restored. Okay, that the, the Ezra had gone back, he had worked on beginning to restore the temple and restoring Jerusalem, but the project was not completed. Nehemiah was grieved in his heart, knowing that without the walls being built, there was still great vulnerability for attack and that the job was not done, God's will has not been achieved. So Nehemiah, with a broken heart, goes to the king and says, I want to build, and king, I want you to pay for it. And the king went, okay. It was, it was a great time. It really, really was. And so Nehemiah went back into Jerusalem. They got the walls built. People wanted to kill Nehemiah for building the walls. People within Jerusalem, people without, okay, from the outside, they're wanting to kill Nehemiah. They're wanting to uh, stop the walls from being built, but they still got built. And it got done. And the walls were up. The gates got hung. The doors were completed. Everything was great. It was a Tony Tiger moment. And then... Nehemiah realized that you can have all the things great on the outside, but still be dead and rotten and disorganized on the inside. Even though the outside looks great, the inside is still destroyed and fallen apart. So he grabbed up a list of genealogies and started calling in the people into the city. And he starts organizing the people within the city. And he tries to get everything in order so that the nation can function like the people of God, not just looking like it on the outside, but acting like it on the inside. And so that's what we went through last week, was that big, long, 60-some verses of names. Now here's where we left off. Chapter 7, verses, uh, starting at verse 66, we left off at 65 last week, we're going to hit verse 66, and here's where we're going to talk about a whole bunch of, here's the total number of people, and here's the budget. Isn't that exciting? I mean, this is the climax of our discussion. We're going to talk about the budget. I know, this is just not a sexy topic, but we're not going to spend a lot of time here. We're just going to go through this and see what's going on. So starting at verse 66, and the whole assembly together was 42,360 besides their male and their female servants of whom there were 7,337. And they had 245 male and female singers. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, their donkey 6,720. See, they're doing an asset report. Okay, they're trying to figure out what they got going on and what's all here. Some from among the heads of the father's households gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 gold drachmas, 50 basins, 530 priest garments. Some of the heads of the father's homes gave to the treasury of the work 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,020 silver minas. That which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,000 silver minas and 67 priests' garments. Now the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all Israel lived in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the sons of Israel were in their cities. And really, this should be translated, uh, and when the seventh month came, as the children were living within their cities, and we go on to chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, but we'll cover that in just a moment. So here's what's going on here. Okay, real quick, here's the total number. We went through all the families, all the genealogies, all the numbers. Nehemiah kind of gives you a quick total, sums it all up, and then does a quick inventory account. And then he tells how much they tithed. Think about that for a moment. Here's how much people gave for the project. Okay, how much people from their own pockets gave. Man, what if churches today did that? <laughs> what if we decided to do that? Take our income from our tithes that we give, even in our offering box outside the, 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 the um, sanctuary area here, out in the entryway, or we, and we take the list of online giving, and we decide to post that on our website. So you can go to uh, www.anchorcommunitychurch.org and go under giving and see the list of every person and how much they gave. And it's there for the whole world to see and that we keep it up there for history. What do you think of that idea? Yeah, people, uh, now you're not finding it funny. <laughs> Before, this was cute, but now it sounds like it's something I would do. <laughs> so, so now you're, you're getting nervous. <laughs> so people are like, I'm going to the website. Is it there? <laughs> you know, no, it's not there. But, but <laughs> this is what they did. And it's in Scripture. I mean, that's, that's, that's intimidating to us, isn't it? 
It's like, it's a violation of privacy. How much I give is how much I give or don't give. And, and it can be real convicting to us because if church did this to today, would you be embarrassed? If churches did this, would you be afraid or angered? And then the question would be, why? Because usually if people are having a proper tithing attitude, there isn't embarrassment. There isn't fear. There isn't anger. It's, well, if you want to do that, whatever, I, I'd question why, and there'd be discussions about that. But usually people go, oh, that would be horrible, absolutely horrible, horrible. And then I would expect that maybe, possibly, probably the tithing is low on your part, or you aren't giving, and that's why you're reacting in that defensive manner. And so it'd be a good challenge to ask, if it got posted, would you be embarrassed? Would it say your name and then zero? Next to names with numbers, and what does that mean? Is that, is, that, is that convicting at all? That maybe, you know, it's just, it's a good thought, just a place in the head. That, that if you are embarrassed, maybe there should be some conviction there. That you ought to look and ask, are you tithing? Are you working toward helping the ministry go? Because as we have said in the past, this is free, but it's not free. You know what I mean? Right? You didn't have to buy a ticket to attend. You don't have to buy an admission to uh, some type of profile online. You don't have to pay for access to our web page like some sites do. You don't have to, you know, uh, when we download, when, you, when we put, post our sermons, you don't have to have an account and pay for that account to have access to the sermons. It's all free online. And when we do our anchor groups and materials free, it's all free. But it's not free because it costs us money. And that money only comes from you guys. That's it. That, that's what affords it. And so here's Nehemiah. Yes, he has money from the government coming in to help pay for the rebuilding of stuff, but now they got to live and function. Now life has to happen. Now ministry has to work in a further direction, and now they have to support themselves on that. And so Nehemiah says, hey, look at what all these people are giving. These people are, in other words, he's showing that Israel as a whole, who's all in Jerusalem, are unifiedly on board. They are all the people, all the families are all so passionate of what God is doing that they're saying, here, if this will help it even be better and, and more effective, here's money. Here's what we got. You know, some people don't even have a whole lot of just money to give. So they're giving priestly robes or, or whatever to help the worship be better. You know, this would be like if I showed up and I just, I didn't have any nice clothes on. And you'd be like, you know, it would be great if, so here's a pair of pants for you, pastor. Get rid of those boxers shorts you know and, and uh, I almost thought about preaching today in boxer shorts <laughs> you know I had one that had the Grinch on the front and Merry Christmas right <laughs> you know but but it, it, they're just here's priestly robes and they're giving sacrificially giving because they're so passionate together for the ministry of what God's about to do and they understand that it cannot be free. It needs to be offered freely, but it always costs. Always costs. Like our food fair that we have coming up. Okay, it is free to the public. There's free parking. There's free admission. I mean, you can't get free parking in Grand Rapids anywhere these days. Just try driving to any event and get free parking. Right? You just, it doesn't exist. But we're offering it. Free parking. Free admission. It's costing us thousands of dollars. Where is that coming from? You know, so that, that's just what ministry is. It is costly. And here are people that are just on board with the ministry and they're giving. And it's awesome with what they're doing. And so here's what ends up happening. They're all giving to the ministry. They're all gathered within all their cities, all around, all the suburbs, all the neighborhoods, everything around Jerusalem. They're all there. Israel is starting to form. And then they all gather together for something special. The reading of scripture. Now, granted, this is Nehemiah's time period. The Old Testament had not been completely formulated yet, but they did have the Pentateuch, 
the first five books of the Bible, uh, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the law of Moses. They did have some of the historical writings. They did have some of the, of the, pre, of the uh, prophetic writings, the ones that had happened beforehand, pre-exile. Okay, so they had some of Scripture, what had been revealed up to that point. And so the priests had that, and now they're going to read it together. So let's see what happens here in chapter 8, starting at verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. Now this is interesting. They're meeting at where? Watergate, Watergate not the temple. Think about that. They're not meeting at the temple. That would be like a church today having a big, grand, gorgeous cathedral building, and then they all decide to get together, the whole church gets together for the reading of God's word, and they go to Rosa Park Circle. Okay, that's, where, that's what's happening here. They're going to Rosa Park Circle. They're not going to the cathedral. They're not going to a big auditorium with, with fancy lighting and stages. They're just going to Rosa Park Circle. Okay, that's where they're going to. It's interesting. In fact, this whole chapter 8 is interesting. It is counter everything that has happened from Ezra chapter 1 all the way through Nehemiah chapter 1 up through chapter 7. It is a big shift and Nehemiah does not want us to miss this shift. So what he's going to do is he's going to be very repetitive. There's actually three things that he's extremely repetitive about. And I'm going to point these out to you one at a time. Doesn't that sound like fun? And this repetition is necessary because Scripture uses repetition. God uses repetition inspired through the Spirit, the writing that the people were doing when writing the Bible, to be repetitive for the purpose of getting your attention so that you do not miss it. And the problem is, in our society, repetition is bad. Our society teaches us, don't repeat yourself. Don't be, in fact, you write papers. If you say, the snake walked up, the snake slithered up to the house, the snake, you know, hissed at the cat, the snake, you know, launched, and the, the teacher would write, error, redundant, use the word serpent, name the snake, you know, whatever you want to do, but don't keep being redundant like that. Don't be repetitive, and you get graded down. Okay, so we get taught. In fact, a lot of our translations cut out the repetition that's in this text. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, the one I like to read the most from, cuts out 80% of the repetition. So I'm actually going to be quoting from the New American Standard today because it keeps it in, <laughs> a lot of it in. It also cuts about maybe 12%, I think if I did the math right, about 12% of the repetition out because of grammatical purposes because sometimes it just would be weird sounding. But it keeps a lot of the repetition in. So I'm going to be using that for this morning. But So this, this is completely repetitive. There's been times I've repeated myself several times. People will come up to you after the sermon and they'll say, you repeated yourself a lot. I just want to say, sorry, I was thinking Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was very scripturally minded when I preached. You know? uh, <laughs> I have proof text now. <laughs> Nehemiah 8, I can be repetitive and redundant, and it's okay. <laughs> okay so, so I want you, when we're going through this, I want you to notice some of the repetition. Okay, I'm going to point it out after we've read through it. I'm not going to point them all out at the same time. I'm going to start with one, go to a second one, and then toward the end, do a third one. So I want you, if you notice that something's repeating a lot, if you mark in your Bible, underline it, or put a little dot or a little note. Boy, I've heard that again. Are oh, you saying that again? That phrase again? That concept again? Come on, Nehemiah, say something different. Holy cow. And just notice the repetition. Okay, because that, that's, that's what Nehemiah is trying. It just jumps off the page here what Nehemiah wants us to not miss. So as we continue on, all the people are at the water gate, Rosa Park Circle. And they ask Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand. And all the people were attentive to the book of the law. 
Esther the scribe stood at a wooden podium which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, and Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Mushum, Hashbadana. I kept wanting to say banana. <laughs> I end up just really butchering that name. I just, minions, <laughs> banana. Uh, Zechariah and Meshulam on his left hand. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Catching any repetition yet? And then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen. While lifting up their hands, they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Okay, that's the first six verses of what's happening. Here, here's what's going on here. Okay, a couple of, of repetition. First repetition I want you to notice is that there was a, a, a slight emphasis on those who were present were those who could understand. Did you catch that? It was at least twice. Okay, that they were, they were all gathered for the purpose of reading God's word, and the people who were gathered were anyone of any age who were capable of understanding any type of comprehension whatsoever. Because in reality, God's word is meant to be used by all people. Okay, God's word is meant to be used by all people, not just the priests, not just the Levites. It is not a clergy-only thing. Okay, and so many people, they, they, they really, the only Bible study, Bible learning, Bible education they get is when they come to church on Sunday on whatever the Yahoo on the stage says. And that's the end of their biblical learning. And it is not meant to be just like that. It is meant to be for all people. All people are supposed to be able to have access to it. Now, back in the day, there were a limited number of copies. Okay, they didn't have the internet. It was down. Microsoft was still having issues. Not much has changed. All right. uh, the, <laughs> the internet was not working, the apps weren't working, the printing press had a paper jam, and, and the guy was on vacation, so they couldn't get copies printed. Okay, they didn't have copies. They only had like a handful of copies that people would have to hand write. And when you look at just the first five books of the Bible, try writing that out by hand with an ink pen. And then when you get halfway through the book of Exodus, you realize you got carpal tunnel. Right, and you get, and I don't know if you're like me, when I start handwriting, and after about a whole page, I start getting that jitteriness, where I gotta write faster, and it gets sloppier, <laughs> and I just can't write fast enough, my thoughts are like three sentences ahead, the next thing I know, I wrote a sentence and realized that I was actually writing a three sentence ahead sentence, and then it doesn't make sense, I go back and cross it out, and white out, and do it again, okay, I, I hate handwriting, okay, and the, the, they didn't have typewriters, so they had limited number of copies, so what would happen was you would have to have a certain number of copies for each of the cities or each of the regions, and they would read it to the public. They would try to read it out loud to the public. Sometimes you could rent it. You would be able to bring uh, food or hay or some type of money, and you could rent uh, uh, access to the scripture for so many hours in, in a day, and then go back to your village and share what you have rented and what you read. Okay, But what ended up happening was because of this, because it was the priests and the Levites and the clergy who had the copies at the cathedral over the period of time, especially when you start getting beyond the start of the church in the New Testament and you start going toward the middle e medieval time period, you start getting what was ended up happening of this pride and arrogance that the clergy had access to the scripture. And it ended up becoming this, this misguided emphasis on that the clergy were the ones teaching it, and we are the ones that have access to it, and we are the ones that are learned in it. And if you question it, well, then you're, you're wrong because we know and we have access. And it ended up becoming that the clergy had power. Okay, and then it ended up being that in the time that the uh, of part of the Catholic movement, it started off really well and did some great things. They had some great emphasis and great practices, but pride and arrogance came in, and they ended up becoming this massive uh, authority type figure person. So much so that the public was not allowed access to the Bible at all. 
They ended up keeping it translated into Latin, and then they kept it that way. And the priests would actually read from the Latin translation. The people didn't know Latin. And so they didn't know what they was even being read. And then the priest would say, here's what it's saying, and would tell them his interpretation of his translation, which may or may not have been right and oftentimes was not right. Okay, so that's one of the reasons that when Martin Luther read the Protestant Reformation, that of the Reformation came the phrase, it was ironic, a Latin phrase, sola scriptura. And sola scriptura means authority came from scripture alone. And the goal of the Reformation ended up being that there was not, the authority was not placed upon the clergy, but upon the Bible. And so they were all about sola scriptura, which is a great, there was, and we still hold that today. Still today, the emphasis and the soul of authority within the church is on the word of God, not upon the pastor or the bishop or the cardinal or the senior pastor or whatever. Yes, the pastors and the elder board and the, and the deacons and, and bishops, yes, they have some uh, authority as they are a leader of an organization trying to keep things organized, but the ultimate authority comes from the word of God only. And that the congregation can rebuke the leadership on basis of, of the word of God. That if I were to do something against the word of God, you guys could come and rally to rebuke me, to try to correct me. And upon my sinful arrogance and ignorance, if I reject that, you can fire me. But because of the authority upon the word of God, that was not the case pre-Reformation. Okay, so this is this, this, this word of God is the authority. So what is Nehemiah and Ezra doing now? As all the people are gathered, they are reading from the word of God. This is where the authority is. It's not about just the people who are there. It's not that it's the governor or the priest. It's that they are reading from the word of God. They are going to the source of authority. God's revelation. God revealed himself in his word, and that's the authority. And what this authority is meant for is anyone who has any ability to comprehend. Anyone who has any ability of comprehending. It doesn't matter the level of comprehension, long as you have some. I know there are some people that are smarter than others. There are some people that can think more critically than others. Yes, there are some that have higher IQs in this area and higher IQs in that area. There are some people that are really, really good with book smart, and they're, they don't know where the dipstick is in the car. <laughs> okay? and Because and, uh, <laughs> for me, if my car breaks, I kid you not, I'm opening up the hood, I'm putting the thing up, I look at the engine, that's as far as my expertise goes. Okay, and even then, I'm struggling getting the hood up. Where's that latch? It's somewhere around here. You know, it's, I, I am mechanically ignorant, okay? And there are some people that don't know the Bible or don't have the book smarts that, that I have, but they can open up the car, and they can take things apart and put it back together and make it work better, okay? In different levels of comprehension. There are some people that, that are just slower at things, and they're slower at grasping things, and that's all right. What, what is, who is not at this assembly are infants. Okay, it's something that's interesting. This is about people who have the ability to understand because God actually will judge us. This is interesting. God is actually going to judge us, not based on original sin, but based upon what we are responsible for. That's what our judgment is going to be based upon. Okay, so God is going to judge us based upon what we are capable of and responsible for. And once you have the ability to comprehend, you are therefore judged upon what you are comprehending or choosing not to comprehend. So if you are, have the ability to think and to learn, Scripture is your responsibility to learn. It is a place upon you. It is a privilege Okay, that is given to you. And that's what we are seeing here is that, that there's this reading of scripture and anyone who can comprehend is able to come and learn. And all the people came to do that. All the people who have the ability to learn came to do that. In fact, if you would combine the idea of, of, of people who have comprehension and all the people, you got yourself 14 plus times it's repeated in just the first 12 verses. Okay, this is a huge area of repetition, huge area. A second area of repetition that's really big is the shift 
from the temple to the law of Moses. Did you, did you catch that? In fact, the whole purpose that Ezra came there before Nehemiah was to rebuild the temple, and the whole purpose that Nehemiah went there was to rebuild the wall to protect the temple, and now they're not even talking about either. Did you catch that? They're not talking about the temple. They're not, Nehemiah's not saying, hey, we gathered at the temple where we're supposed to do worship. We didn't get, they didn't gather there. They didn't gather at the walls even. He even avoided talking about the walls. Instead, he talks about the water gate. Might as well be the water closet. Okay, it, it, it just, he, he is not mentioning what they are there to do. Instead, the complete shift, <laughs> the complete shift is from the whole job of the temple and the walls onto the word of God. Because Nehemiah is wanting to emphasize that the purpose of authority is also not upon a place. The purpose of worship is not based upon a place. The whole idea of the life of being God's people is not based on a place. It's based on God and his word. That's what it's based on is God and his word. And there are some people that they're all about the building. They're all about the, they're like, it has to be this certain gorgeous building. Or I, I met some people, I invited them to come to church and they said, well, do you have stained glass windows? I went, no. In fact, where we do our services, we have no windows at all. <laughs> okay. And they're like, What? I'm like, we have no windows at all. And they said, well, then how do you let the light in? I'm like, it comes from the ceiling. What do you mean? We let the, we, it's not like it's pitch black. It might be dim around the outside a little bit, but you can still, you know, we got, we got light. And they're like, well, you need stained glass windows or it's not church. And people struggle with that. They struggle with that. In our history as a church, we have struggled with that. We have struggled with that when we went from one building to a college campus to another building, now to a community theater. And it has taken us 10 years to be able to really comprehend that worship is not about a place, it is about a person. It is not about any type of stained glass windows, it is about the sacred Savior. Okay, that we, it took us a while to get there. It really did. And every now and then, some people are less like, you know... You know, before, people were like, you know, I'm not sure we want to leave our building. We like our building. We love our building. And now that we're here, most people are like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> and we're adjusting to it really. We're, we're, we're grasping it. It's taken us a while, a decade <laughs> to get here. You know, y'all take this point, if some of you that have been with us for the past 10 years, recollect what it was like 10 years ago. <laughs> okay, and look at where we're at now. And it's just amazing the maturity that has developed. It is amazing the distance that we have come. Yes, we have had major ups and downs. We have major uh, crossroads and difficulties, successes and failures across the board. I am not about to say that 10 years was perfect from beginning to end, all going uphill. This was a crazy loop-de-loop -loop roller coaster. Okay, but we are all maturing together, and we are at least recognizing worship's not about a place. As one of the areas of growth that we have that we have accomplished, and it's awesome. Okay, so here is Nehemiah, and they're not meeting at a place. That's the emphasis. The emphasis is the scriptures, the word of God. Now, Nehemiah starts reading. And did you notice at all, before we uh, move on to, to verse 7, when Nehemiah started reading, how this all worked? Okay, he started in the morning, and he goes until midday. This is how long Nehemiah preaches for. Six hours. Okay, he preached for six hours. When the six hours was up, starting at verse 7, he designates several teachers that goes to the people and then explains what all the six hours meant. So the learning and the studying and the worship service is not over after the six hours. They just did the initial reading. I never want to hear a complaint about the length of my sermons ever again. <laughs> uh, in our society today, do you know what the average sermon is expected to be and what they teach in homiletic courses at seminaries and is expected around our country? 20 minutes. 
Yeah, it's 20 minutes is to be the complete sermon. Okay, beginning, middle, end, done, 20 minutes. Okay, that's what it's supposed to be. And I have friends who are pastors, and they average anywhere from 10 to 20. I kid you not. One time, one of my friends gave a seven-minute sermon, and I just wanted, I, I was just, I literally, I asked him, what did you even talk about? Man, what did you even say? Did you just do a veggie tail sermon? You go up, God thinks you're special, and he loves you very much, and you walked off? I mean, what, what, what do you do in seven minutes? And he's like, well, what do you do, and how long do you go? I said, I go about 45, 50. He's like, you're supposed to be 20. I'm like, well, that's my introduction. <laughs> what do you mean? 20s, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, I go the, he's like, what do you do in 50 minutes? How could you ever talk like that? And I asked him, how did you ever go to school? How long is an individual class? 50 minutes, okay, if anywhere from 45 to 50, depending on the size of the class and how long roll attendance takes, okay, and, and handing back papers, so anywhere from 45 to 50, and that's usually where I, I float around. And, and I'm like, I, how did you go to school? It, it's called an hour. He's like, well, you're not in school. I'm like, this is the only education people are getting. I'm not giving them seven minutes, <laughs> okay? You know, it, it, it's, but that's what our society, that's what, that's what our society is expecting. It, it's 20. Now, there has been a really big push over the past uh, three to five years uh, we can thank uh, p- pastors like Tony Evans and pastors like uh, uh, Robert Mueller Jr., the president of Southern Seminary, and pastors like Mark Driscoll, who average an hour and 15 minutes per sermon, sometimes even an hour and a half. Okay, and so that those, and they, and, and like, like Mark Driscoll's church, they're, they're over, uh, they had 60,000 for Easter service, and his sermon was an hour and 13 minutes long, I think it was. Okay, and so it, there's been a push now for these longer services because people are craving the word of God. They're, they're beginning to crave it again because they haven't gotten it. They haven't understood how this relates to life. And so there, there is becoming this nice push toward a, a more thorough understanding of Scripture and the teaching of Scripture. It has yet to reach Michigan. <laughs> It really does. There are some people that are like, so you go about 10, 15 minutes? I go, ah, 40, 45. Well, I'm not going there. I'm not sitting there for that long. Well, how long do you sit in a movie? <laughs> you plan on watching the third Hobbit movie? Well, yeah, well, that's three hours right there. I don't know what you're talking about. 45 minutes is nothing compared to that. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're fine. Uh, so Ezra's preaching for six hours, and he's preaching from a podium. Probably the first one. It's like the first one ever mentioned in Scripture. And the purpose of the podium is so that Ezra, you want to know why the podium existed? People treat it all holy now. I remember when I first started going to something small, there was, people were like, use the big one. It's supposed to represent the Word of God. It's supposed to be big and bulky and in the way like the Word of God is. You aren't supposed to be able to pick it up and move it because the Word of God should be right there. And love people's reasoning behind things. You know why podiums were invented in the first place? So the pastor could preach longer. <laughs> Nehemiah could not preach for six hours holding a 50-pound scroll. Okay, he could not sit there and roll this thing and read the Hebrew and roll it a 50-pound parchment. That gets heavy. And so Nehemiah is preaching, and he's reading, you know, and he, before, that's how they would do it, and he wouldn't be able to go very long. And they're like, Nehemiah, we're like, Ezra, Ezra, I'm sorry, Ezra, not Nehemiah. They're like, Ezra, we want you to preach. We want you to read the God's word. We want you to read from the law. And he's like, well, okay, I can get you a good half hour. My arms are going to fall off. That's okay, Ezra. We got a plan. We prepared in advance a chance for you to just set it down. Thunk. Now, how long can you read? I can go all day. Cool. And they sat. <laughs> Go all day, Ezra. And so he did. Six hours right there. Okay, and so they m- made a podium for him so that he could preach longer. You want to shorten up my sermons? Take away my podium. <laughs> See if it's missing next week. 
That's okay. This is a very light Bible right here, too. <laughs> I, got, I got a copy of it on my phone. <laughs> so, uh, but, but that's why the podium existed. They gave them a stage to stand on. So many people say, well, why do you have a stage? Stages don't belong in worship. Ezra stood on a platform on a stage to help elevate him up so that when the people bowed to the ground, they were lower than the word of God because they revered the word of God as holy and it was kept up high and so the people can see so that they could bow to the ground. In fact, it's interesting that when they're having worship, not only did they have a podium, not only did they have a stage, it looks, sounds a lot like modern day church, doesn't it? It drives me nuts and people say, well, the church of today is nothing like the church of the Bible. Read Nehemiah. It's exactly like it is today. We actually are hitting it on the head. Okay, it's actually just right. And, but here's what the people were doing. How were they worshiping? What did they do with their hands? The hands were up. And they worshiped with their hands. Who made your hands? God did. And everything God made was for the purpose of worship. Worship. So your hands are meant to be instruments of worship. Now, we use our hands to sin all the time. Okay, we use our hands to sin all the time. Whether it's waving one finger or a click of a mouse, we use our hands to sin all the time. And we're supposed to use our hands to worship. And so when we sing songs, it is all right to raise your hands. It's not charismaniac, it's biblical. It is completely biblical to worship with your hands. And no, it's, no, it's completely, uh, you know what I think is one of the coolest, most romantic things on the, on the face of the earth? Married couples. Because here's the thing. If you're, if you're single, yeah, you got hands to worship. If you're married, praise God for two hands. Because. Don't go anywhere weird with me. Okay, but because nothing is more cool, nothing is more romantic than a married couple who can hold their spouse in one arm and raise their hand in praise in the other. That is the awesomest sight in the world, to be able to wrap your arm around the one you love and raise your hand up to the God who made you and to be able to worship together in one mighty voice as a couple you're meant to be. That is romantic. That is awesome. That is what it should be seen in churches across this country, are married couples in each other's arms, raising their arms before their Father in heaven. That is worship right there needs to happen. So I encourage that, that we can just raise our hands in praise and worship of our Father. That's what they were doing there. Their arms were up. They were worshiping. Their faces were down. They're praising. They're just, they're just all about what they're reading, all about their Creator. It's just an awesome, awesome time. So after Nehemiah, after Nehemiah, after Ezra was done, it's so weird that Ezra and Nehemiah, they, they're contemporaries, they, their lines cross over, and so Ezra is, is preaching, and the six hours are done. Enter verse seven. Also, Joshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, uh, Akub, Sabbathai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kelai, um, Kelida, Azariah, Jobadad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites uh, explained the law to the people while they remained in their place. Okay, um, what this means, one of two things happened. Either way, it's the same thing. Either these Levites mentioned came up and began taking turns, explaining the law to the people, or they went as individuals to the people where they were at and kind of formed little anchor groups. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and they explained it that way. That's the way I think it went on. Is that after Ezra was done, he lowered down the, the law, and then he had the people go to where everybody was in their little area there, and they kind of formed little groups. And then they started teaching them. Here's what they did. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating. Okay, this is interesting. Okay, so that somehow I don't know how all this worked. Whether they went, that's why some people think they stayed at the podium because they read. Or they came from what they read and they went back. But they translated to give the sense so that the people understood the reading. And they translated so that the people understood the reading. Here's what's happening. The Jews have been in exile for a long time, for a long time. The, it, the temple has been destroyed for like over 100 and almost 20, 120 plus years. 
Okay, so over a hundred years, it's been, we're talking generation has come and gone. And Israel has been in exile. They have been first under Babylonian rule. They were split and, and divided, as so they got conquered. They got spread all over the uh, greater Babylonia. And then the Persians came in, defeating uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and the Persians came in. So then you get Xerxes and Artaxerxes that came into power. Now they're under Persian rule. Needless to say, everyone's speaking other languages than Hebrew. There's even a good chance that most of the Jews didn't even speak Hebrew. That when they heard the Hebrew text being read, they had no idea of what was being said. And so then Ezra said, okay, Levites, you guys, you, you, your, your families have been faithful. You know the text, you know Hebrew. I want you to go amongst the people and I want you to translate it. I want you to go there. I want you to go to the people. I want you to tell them what this means, what is being read, what is being said. Help them get this. Help them to understand this. Help them to apply it because they're also 100 years removed or um, significantly more actually from when the text was even first written. Half of them don't even remember what the law even was because it wasn't passed down like it was supposed to be and this is all new now to them. They might have heard of it, but they don't know it. Does this sound like America today at all? That we're so far removed from the text? It was so many years ago. How does this apply to everyday life? How is this relevant? What does this mean to me? Why is this word of God significant? I've heard of it, but I don't really know it. I know it's in Hebrew and Greek and parts of it are in Aramaic and very few, but a couple areas. I, I don't know Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic, some of you may say. And, and so therefore, it's why we have translators, why we have pastors and small group leaders and teachers to try to say, hey, here's the word of God. Let me read it. Let me pop it on a screen for you. And then when you go, well, I, I still, that's a lot of mumbo jumbo. What, what does half of this mean? Well, that's why it takes more than 20 minutes, okay, to explain what is going on, how this is relevant, how this can impact our life in any way. This is why we do what we do, because it takes time. And this is what, what we're about even right now, is we get to read from God's word, and then I get to do my best to act like Ezra and the Levites here to try my best to, to explain it to you, to use the resources available to me to go back and retranslate what needs to be uh, understood so I can go back to some of the Hebrew and the Greek to the uh, best of my ability and then try to present this to you in a way that, that can just dig into your lives. That's what we're here and what we're about. Okay, that's part of what we're here for. And so that's what they were doing even then. And then it continues on. Verse 9, the Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people and said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Let's pause here for a minute. You may have heard it said, uh, I've heard people say this, nowhere in the Bible does it say do not grieve, usually said to people who are dealing with funeral situations. Actually, it is in the Bible. It's actually in there twice. In this chapter, uh, happening both times, where Nehemiah actually tells them, do not mourn or weep. But we do have to understand what he is telling them not to mourn or weep about. Because it's not about a funeral. It is not about the loss of a loved one. It's about something very, very different. Let's finish up the passage here, and then we'll continue on. And we'll explain what they're weeping about. For all the people were weeping when they heard... What? The words of the law. In other words, they are weeping because they have recognized that they have failed God. They are weeping and mourning and grieving and faces to the ground, shedding tears because they have dishonored God. Because they have recognized that they are sinners. 
that they have failed. They have not honored God appropriately. They have not been following the law. They have found out why they were in exile in the first place, that Israel was put into exile because they rejected God as their God. And so God put them into exile. That was the judgment. And that happened to their forefathers. And that's inherited upon them until somebody repents. Until someone says enough of continuing this life of sin. Let's repent and change. And let's have God be our God and we be his people. And so they're weeping and they're grieving. Did you know that under the most recent Barna research, that in the evangelical church circles, that would be any church within the United States of America that is believing that the word of God is God's word completely and the word of God alone is God's word and that Jesus and Jesus only is the means for salvation. Those are evangelical churches. Okay, Southern Baptists are of the evangelical church group. Okay, as are many other, most other Baptists and Christian Reformed and, and many denominations fit that bill. Okay, of those groups that believe that, of the evangelical churches, over 80% have never had a moment of weeping or grieving regarding their sin. Over 80% have no real recollection of the honesty of what their sin is. They've had no emotional catharsis. They do not get the reality of sin. They say it like it's no big deal. Like they would say that you're wearing an ugly shirt. They say, yes, I am a sinner. We are all sinners. And they just say it. But it has no teeth. They do not get what the sin means. If there's weeping at all, it's from getting caught and the consequences that came from getting caught, not because they have dishonored and broken the heart of God. Here, Israel, the people have realized that regardless of all the consequences in life, regardless of exile, regardless of broken relationships, regardless of losing jobs or whatever the case is, they have broken the heart of God. They have grieved him. They have violated his will, his law, and that broke them to the point of falling to the ground and weeping. And Nehemiah's words to them with the Levites and with Ezra, the priest and scribe, is stop weeping. Isn't that amazing? This is so encouraging. This is so comforting. They're like, oh my word, we have failed God. We have sinned. We have done so much wrong. We have been so ignorant, so lazy, so naive, so selfish, so arrogant, so everything. At their breaking down, they're crying. And Nehemiah says, okay, go to the people and tell them, lift up your faces. Dry off your tears and celebrate. Because here we are again in the nation of Israel and we're being renewed as a people and God is wrapping his arms around us and he is loving us with his grace and is putting upon us his forgiveness. And we need to gather now to celebrate in the law of God rather than mourn or weep. And that's what Nehemiah does. He says to them, go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, the hope that is found in God will give you strength to make it through whatever you're dealing with and that his forgiveness is available and his restoration is available and that is a cause for celebration. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went away to eat, to drink, and to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival, because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Now, this is important here. I want you to catch this, that they went to celebrate a what? A great festival. I want you to catch this. When was all this happening? Look back at the beginning of chapter 8 and the end of chapter 7. This is all happening at what time period? The beginning of the seventh month. What happens at the beginning of the seventh month? The Feast of Trumpets. The beginning of the seventh month of the Feast of Trumpets, on the tenth day of that month, the Day of Atonement, and on the fifteenth day, the beginning of the Feast of the Tabernacles and the removal of the sabbatical debts. 
In other words, what is happening is this. The people are saying, oh my word, we have not been uh, following God like we're supposed to be. We are greed, we are sinners. And Nehemiah and all the people say, yes, you are, you're sinners. Then stop grieving about this. Get up and start obeying. And they get up and their first response is obedience. It's the seventh month, the beginning of the seventh month. God's word said, have the feast of the trumpets. Okay, let's get the food, let's get the wine, let's get everything, let's do the festival of the trumpets. And let's have the day of atonement, and let's do the feast of the, tab- of the, feast of the tabernacles. Let's, let's start doing what God has called us to do all along. And so they immediately get up from the ground, they wipe their tears, and they start obeying the law of God. They start obeying it. From the get-go, that's what they do. What's your response when you hear the word of God preached? What is your response when we leave here on Sunday? Do you feel grieved? Do you feel convicted? Do you say, man, I see the word of God. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I haven't been doing it. I haven't been forgiving people that hurt me. I haven't been trying to become holy in the eyes of God. I've not asked for forgiveness of sin. I've not been doing the great commission and trying to proclaim Christ to others. I've not been reaching out to others. I've not been loving. I've not been faithful. I've not been, and this is grieving. And you know what? I'm gonna start doing that. What's your response to the word of God? Are you willing to leave here and say, I'm going to start acting like a child of God. I'm going to stop playing a game like children playing house. I'm not going to play church. I'm not going to date the church. I'm going to be part of the church, in the church, of the church, for the glory of God. And I'm going to leave here not just to live my life the way I want, how I want, whatever, but I'm going to view my life as being a missionary life, that I am on task, on call for serving God, for honoring Him. I'm going to leave here when I go to the stores, not just because I'm going to the stores, but it's because I have a chance to reach people at that store, that I have a chance to do whatever. Are you willing to leave here to be on task as a soldier sent out to the battlefield every day of the week and be like that for you? Because you have a chance to serve God and to glorify Him on a daily basis. But do you leave here and just not respond at all? Who are the people that responded? to Nehemiah's statement and to Ezra's preaching and to the Levite's teaching. Who are the people that responded? There is one more repetition. It happens 13 times in these 12 verses. And it is a phrase. The first repetition was that there was the, the people of understanding and comprehension. It was interesting that the word of God was for, for the people who can comprehend. And that secondly, there was the repetition of the focus from the temple onto the word of God. The third one is literally the phrase, all the people. It's literally the phrase, all the people. No one was left out. No one did not respond. All the people, every single one of them responded. How many? All. Not most, not some, not many, all, all responded. It's interesting when you go forward to the book of Acts chapter 5. And in the book of Acts, there's there's the beginning of the church, and the church has started, and Jesus had ascended, and and all the the apostles were there, and the disciples were there, and they're getting ready to start the church. And they decided that as a big group at the starting of the church to uh, all dedicate every possession they have, everything that they own, everything that they have as an asset in their life to not be considered their own, but to be used for God's glory and for his purposes and for his kingdom. And they all on the outside said, amen, amen we agree, but one guy and his wife did not. Ananias and Sophia, okay, or Ananias and, yeah, and Sapphira, okay, these two, Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, did not. They said they would, like everyone else, yes, we agree, hearty amen, verily, truly, more of the same, absolutely, but they kept and buried some of the stuff that they had took some of the money, and they kept it for themselves, and it was not all And Peter found out about this. 
because something was happening. God's favor wasn't exactly the way it was supposed to be. Something was off. Something was twisted. And so Peter went, and he went to uh, the, the, the people, and he says, Ananias, Sapphira, what have you guys done? And what ended up happening, when they found out what they had done, God actually struck them dead. And this was very concerning for a lot of people. Why would God respond so harshly like that? He doesn't strike people dead today for doing that. And I'm very grateful he does not. Okay, otherwise our congregation would be a lot smaller. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, and he does not. But he did on that first time. Because God wanting the church to start off on the best possible foot that it could, could have. So a lot of times what God does is he starts out extremely strict to set the example of how important this is. And then he releases that and allows people to completely screw things up if they so desire. Consequences come, but it's not always so immediate and so extreme. But when God starts off with Israel, if people weren't following Moses right and going to the wilderness right, the earth came, opened up and the people fell into the crevices. Snakes came and bit people. There was death all the time as God tried to help them start as best as they possibly can from the start. Same thing in the beginning of the church, at the beginning of the New Testament there in Acts. Was they, God responded very quickly. But here's the point. Even one person then could actually detract from the effectiveness of the ministry. Even just one person has the ability to halt the effectiveness of what God is wanting to do. That God wants all people to be as one voice. If you look back to chapter 8, verse 1, how did the people approach Ezra and approach Nehemiah about even the reading of God's word? They all came as if one man. They were all united together for that purpose. And if some people here would, would hear this, and if some of you were to say, well, fine, if one person can spoil the whole thing, then I just won't show up. That way I won't spoil anything. Except then not all the people are present. If you're called to be here, then your absence means that not all are here. And that could have a serious negative impact. See, we are all responsible for this charge to try to serve and honor God together as our little church body. We're all responsible. We all have a role to play. You're not insignificant. And we all need to be united together. And what we need as a church, as we're looking at getting ready to launch, as we're looking at trying to restart and replant and get things focused and going right, so that we can actually engage this community for the gospel of Christ. If we're going to do this, what we absolutely need is revival, revolution, and rededication with repentance. Like that for our words? We need revival with revolution. We need revival with revolution. That it needs to be different. It needs to be serious. It needs to be now. We need revival with revolution that includes rededication and repentance. It includes ourselves saying that I am dedicated to serving Christ. Because here's the thing, if you're going to say that you are a Christian, if you are going to say that you are a little Christ and you are following him, he is your savior, you are a captive in sin and Christ came and broke your chains and you are free and Jesus says, now go rescue captives. Are you doing it? Are you dedicated to following him? Are you changing your life? Are you becoming more holy and working toward honoring him and serving him? Are you dedicated like that? And some of us might need to rededicate. To say that I am tired of just Playing games, showing up, singing songs just because they're a song. And either I like it or don't based upon the beat, but it sure ain't worship. I'm sure not lifting up my voice to my heavenly father. I'm just singing a song. Are you willing to actually worship? Are you living life to just get a job, to just pay bills so that you can just have your next chance to buy the next video game and see the next movie at the theater? Are you actually living with purpose 
to touch the lives of people in the name of Christ and honoring God the Father. This is the Christian life. It is a life of purpose and direction. And we might need to rededicate that to no longer playing games, but to get absolutely dead on serious. To be completely committed, rededicated. That might mean that we might have to repent and say, God, I have been lazy. I have been enjoying not doing anything and letting everybody else tear, carry the weight. That I have been lazy, that I have not been dedicating time. I have been wasting my time playing with this phone app or playing with that tablet or playing on this controller or going and doing whatever, that I have been wasting my time. Yes, I can do some of that a little bit, but after about five hours, I've wasted the day. <laughs> and that it is time to stop being lazy. And I know some of you might be hearing some of this, and you might want to respond with anger. Well, you don't know the type of day I've had. Well, you don't understand. I'm in a unique situation, and you're just going to want to try to justify and defend yourself and respond with anger. It might even be, well, I'm never going to that place again. That place is too heavy. It's just too serious for me. I just want a nice, light, fluffy popcorn sermon. Just, you know. Well, that's not the Christian life. If Israel had responded that way, the walls would have never been built. The temple would have never been completed. Israel would have never formed to worship. And the revival we're about to see in Israel would not have taken place. If the apostles had done that, the church wouldn't have gone forward. Thousands wouldn't have been saved. All throughout scripture, whenever you see lazy people, you find failure. Wherever you see the people working for the kingdom of God in a great and mighty way, it's because the people were not lazy. We need a great revival. We need a great revolution. We need to rededicate, recommit, repent so that we can be on mission, on task for God's glory. We have all the makings of the potential of a great impact in our city and we need to put the right foot forward and that starts with each one of us because we all have to come back to the heart of worship. We all have to come back to this lifestyle of worship. That's what we need, every single one of us.